my name is Guillermo del Toro, and I want to welcome you to the Metrograph live screenings. I am joined uh, by Greer Patterson and Almos Schnabel to discuss the beautiful movie Giants Being Lonely. Welcome, guys. Thank you for coming here to talk. Well, thank you. Thank you for thank you for being here. It was it was uh, first. I would like to say because Greer may or may not know how I came in contact with the movie. Uh, I was having a, an afternoon with almost dad and he asked the worst thing you can ask for a filmmaker would you look at, at a movie that a friend of Olmo did and that he produced and I was absolutely terrified because that's a situation that you normally don't live alive you have to like dance really fast and say well it's all there you know <laughs> good luck with it and and then I uh, started seeing the movie And I was completely fascinated by it. Alma knows this. I was, I was blown away because uh, the you can trace certain influences. You can, but it's a completely beautiful uh, voice that comes in in a very pristine way, in a very effortless way, deceivingly effortless. Because the movie is deceivingly, to the untrained eye, it is deceivingly lo-fi in a way, but then the rigorous construction of images is a, has an incredible level of uh, sense of light, composition, color, the rhythms, you know, and it's a movie that asks you, either you surrender or not, that's your choice, but it asks you to live in it. And, and I started living in it, and We stayed on delayed. We talked about the final image, you know, which you shot a, a little later, and we talked about all of that. I, I had very few uh, pieces of advice to say. I was just fascinated by your movie, and that's why I'm here. I mean, I'm not here um, as a favor. I'm not here because I'm a trooper. I'm here because I love the movie. I really love the movie, and I thought, wow, out of the gate, first movie. And and uh, he has a voice that, you know, we're like singers, right? Yeah. And and if you hear a voice that moves you, you just want to hear more. So that's why I'm here. That I wanted to say that. So my first question, which is uh, the very basic one, the title made perfect sense, but I don't know why. So what can you tell me about it? Yeah, so it, it, it comes from a, a Sandberg poem, like a Carl Sandberg. So he and, and Edward Steichen, they were they were close friends. And um, I was born in, in his house. And it basically just led me to this line. I used it for a show. And, and you just read the, the poem. And it talks about the circumstance of man and how we all are kind of at the edge of life and how we, we all had kind of adversity and all these things. And then in the end, it just says, but we were all giants being lonely. And yeah. I felt like how it was really this encompassing thing that just put us all together and, and made us really realize how connected we all are. It is, and, and, and loneliness is not the purview of, you, 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 not the purview of young, just the young characters or the adults. You get a sense that everybody is sort of trapped in a, in a, in a labyrinth of sorts. Uh, some have been given up to the to looking for a solution and just become whatever circumstance made them. Uh, others resist but don't have the tools. It's a very interesting um, film about loneliness. It reminded, the, the thing that it reminded me of in a strange way because it has, um, it has a, a, a very compassionate, very warm, uh, but not Uh, not a view of a, a, a young um, adult, you know, coming or, or a group of young adults. It reminded me a little of um, the young couple of filmmakers, you know, Gia and Sophia in a way. is sort of a, a counterpart to Virgin Suicides in a strange way for me, or obviously Elephant and all that stuff. But But there is a compassion, but there is no no there's not a compulsion to explain and i wanted to ask you both uh if you had this clear from the start that you would that it would be almost like a tonal poem rather than a than a plot uh driven movie yeah 
I, I think we want, that was clear from, from the beginning for sure. We wanted it to be a really image driven and emotionally driven story. And we wanted to refine it as much as possible so that the cues were just, just there enough so that you knew where you were going, but you could bring in, bring as many elements as you wanted to the story that were from your own life, your own experiences, where you can make it as relatable as possible, but as efficient as possible. I also think at that moment in your life, when you're an adolescent, I don't think it's as easy to actually communicate what's going on in your life and to actually be someone who can, um, you know, if you're vulnerable or you're going through a hard time, sometimes we don't want to talk about that and we want to pretend like everything's okay. So I think that the move, I think that Greer and I, we remembered being young and not really talking about the things that bothered us and kind of being, um, it was almost claustrophobic because it wasn't something we were comfortable doing. So I think that these characters exist also in the present and you know that they have something, they have relationships from before, Bobby and Caroline, Adam, you know that, but the movie takes place in the present. So you, you're, you come into these people's lives and then you come out of them. So like Greer said, we let people relate to the movie with their own experience which leaves it more open-ended, but I think it's interesting that people can have their own relationship with the movie and everyone doesn't have the same, the same experience. No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican. I grew up in a completely different environment, but the feeling uh, of being an adolescent it can be permeated by adversity, by different social circumstances, by different uh, social structures, blah, blah, blah. But the, the essence, what is fascinating for me is I think in the last two or three generations, uh, which happened after World War II, after uh, the uh, baby boom, after these things, art and, and a sensation of um, almost creative melan melancholy, you know, has permeated uh, some of our generations. And it's, it's, if you survive childhood, which childhood is, survival camp if you make it out biologically semi-intact and and you have a sensitive soul you are by definition in your adolescence full of artistic emotion and understanding in a very very uh, instinctive way so most adolescents uh, have this melancholy feeling of the world that is absolutely right by the way, but don't have the tools to express it. And I like that the movie makes a commitment about that is yes, there's sensitivity. Yes, there is fragility there is, but they're not quoting Lord Tennyson. They're not discussing uh, art at a high level. They are just adolescents, which is a work of art. Adolescence is a work of art, living. So uh, wh how much of that Greer was a biographical, not in the anecdotal sense, but in, in that emotion that you were able to evoke. Yeah, I would say it's pretty much 100% autobiographical in that respect. So that was, that, you tried to capture that emotion. Yeah. That is aimless, not aimless, and yet uh, very pure, right? I mean, they, they, they wonder they're almost like litmus tests. They they show the insincerity. By being there, they show the insincerity of the adult world. And they but, but what I like is that they the symbols of the teenage movie exist in the film. The prom, the baseball, the coach, you know, the 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 love affair, the rivalry for a girl, all these things are there, but they're there disarticulated. Did you make that uh, as a conscious effort? Well. Yeah, I think I wanted to pay homage to all the movies that made me want to write and, and be interested in, and, and be so emotionally engaged and, and, and watch and the films that I watched that made me feel like I wasn't alone, that made me feel like I participated in that type of event or that type of feeling. But then I also wanted, or we wanted to make it true to the, the notion of, of what we were saying before. So we wanted, you know, to see more of, of the, the guy's life, see more what it was like to wander and really exist um, than what it meant to be practicing every single day. You know? And it's a threshold, right? I mean, how old are you? I'm 33. So you had 33 choices. Yeah. 
of when, what story to make, right? You could have told the story of you at age four, at age six. Uh, why was this, why, why was that moment between school and the world the important one for you? Well, I think I, because I think when I was, was left to really be able to reflect with, with, this, with this event that had happened to me, which was, was have a kid that I went to school with actually have these events transpire. And I was the first one to know about it. And so it, it became a, a real emotional burden for me because I had to tell my, 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 my science advisor and then tell all these other kids and, and basically deal with the dissemination of the information responsibly. And so I was really commiserating with, with this kid and also, also feeling like how strange it is to know someone and, and have, have, have your understanding of what they were going through shift so quickly. And, um, I got a job in London and that's when I wrote the story because I was alone in a house. So it was my first time ever being alone, really isolated. And so I, I was just kind of, I didn't know what to do. And I would just watch the kind of the whole film in my head over and over. And, and then I would just write it to relax. The, the, the event that transpired, what was it? He basically, he basically had a party and, and, be, and he wanted to do it. I don't know if it was really like it happened in the story, but basically when he had this party, all of the, all of the kids were calling and, and, and complaining about a smell. And then a week later, they realized that the parents had actually been there dead the whole time. Um, but so I was just, I was also just making an effort to try to show a little bit of a human side of the whole aspect and not, not make it explicitly about, about the event that happened to me, but just that notion itself, how difficult it is to get through it and, and to have parents. And, and even if they're trying, you might not get what they're trying to do for you and how this disconnect is 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 part of the human condition well almost i want to ask you when you became involved but let me before before saying that this makes so much sense and visually I, when i saw the movie the final image was for me not shocking it was actually it it made perfect sense for me It's the only way to end the movie, I thought. I, I have heard other people say, well, it comes out of nowhere. And you know, really, how can that be? And now that I hear this story, it moves me deeply because this is quite literally, you want the audience to experience what you did, which is you lived with this guy for in the, in the course of that time through these seemingly unimportant events. And that discovery was a punch in the face and that you replicate that for the audience. But it's so beautiful to hear you talk about that. It's so great, man. Well, it moves me deeply that, that you achieved it because the construction visually of the movie, you have things that, you know, you, you have the image of the gazebo that I can think it, it reminds me of Madrid. You have the, the, the yellow purity of the jerseys against the black in the sky. There's a painterly, not surprisingly, a painterly sensibility. Uh, but that palette then evolves into the beautiful sort of beautiful, terrible flashing of red and blue of the police that absorbs the entire frame Is, is, is the real world is not longer the cloistered uh, adolescence or even if, if you're exposed to bad parenting or this and that now, this is garish and brutal, you know? And, and the evolution of the soundtrack, the final, the final minutes of the film go into this almost reverie, you know? And I think these are tools that are not, I, I, it's very hard for sometimes to explain this to people, these are choices you made, that you worked on, that you designed, that you pursued, and you organized uh, in, in a composition. And, and because movies are just, they go, they go in front of our eyes, they happen. The deliberate notion is hard to, if you're not a filmmaker, it's harder to see. This is very moving that you organized this construction, this composition to end like that. It's so beautiful. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm back to the Q and the A. And no, you were instrumental in making sure that those heads were at the end of the movie because it was a big question that Greer and I had. And in the script, it was there. But then when we finished the movie, we didn't know if we needed it. But it was great when you saw it and you said that it was a must. And 
you know, it was really, we needed that push. And I think it, vale la pena, you know, it was, it was, it was, it, it was, and, and it was, it, it, it was discussed that they had to be perfect, which they are, by the way, because that's the hardest thing to execute is that. First of all, uh, not to get technical, but a cutoff head looks fake in the real world. And for a fake cutoff head to look real in a movie is exceedingly hard. And the composition is beautiful, but is not mannered. Uh, it's brutal, but it's not gory. It's, uh, they, every time, what, what I try to explain to, to people that don't make films is that the director uh, is a writer or a painter, and there's a specific adjective that exists through audiovisual means, or a specific shade of color that exists through audiovisual means. And if you waver, imperfection creates the wrong word, the wrong rhythm, the wrong, and, and the ending for me is perfect. So almost, when did you became involved? How did you guys meet? How early were you involved in the project? Um, Greer and I had been friends for a really long time. I've known him since I was 13 years old. And he was someone throughout my adolescence that I actually could be open with. So he was one of the few people I could communicate with. And when I was a kid, I would go over to the, his studio and we'd hang out. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but he was someone who would listen and who I felt comfortable with and who could give me good advice. And we always had this idea of collaborating and working together, but we never found it. And he was planning to make this movie and I'd heard about it and I was living in Los Angeles and I called him one day and I said, can you please send me the script? I'd love to read it. Um, and then I read it and I immediately felt connected and I wanted to be a part of it and it wasn't something I wanted to let pass by. So I called him the next day and I was impressed and I said, so what do we need to do? And he said, well, come back to New York and we'll go to North Carolina together and I'll show you what I've been working on. And also my two closest friends since I was a child, Jack and Ben, were already attached to be in the movie. So mm -hmm. the whole thing sounded fun and I didn't want to miss out. Um, so this was, it was May of 2018. And then by July of that, of that same year, we were in North Carolina doing something together with a group of friends and really just going for something with no, I don't think we knew what we were getting ourselves into but we were confident that we were there to do something together and we wanted the best. So it was really a, a really natural and intimate experience and it was a blast. I mean, I hope that we can still have as much fun doing this in the future as we did this time around because- Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. Yeah, but we had, we had a really great time and it was amazing to just It was our first time doing something. So when it's your first time, you're just going for it. You don't really know whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. It's just intuition and instinct. And it was great to be able to have a family there and everyone having the same, you know, the, everyone wanted to do the same thing. So I think that translates in the movie. And I think how intimate the environment was also translates in the movie. In terms of the cinematographer and the sound design and music, Uh, can you uh, talk uh, to me about your collaborators in searching for this? What did you give them? A frame of reference, a latitude? Were you super specific? Who are they? Can you talk about them? For the sound, we, we Nico Osborne, he did all of the sound with 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 Will, and then we did all all the post in um, with Hobo Audio with Steve. And then we kind of actually, in the end, I finished the last bit in Spain with a company that actually worked with you. And they were really, because I was always still very proud about your kind of interaction with the film. And so I was, I was talking about, and, and yeah, so that we, we worked together and I'm sorry that I'm spacing on their name, but Hunter Zimney, he was the best for, for the DP. He came in and we storyboarded. Wait, wait, wait. How did you meet him? Oh man. So basically we're all sitting around the table, like uh, in uh, 11th street at our at, at the office that we, Julian had provided for us and um we were just like well who's gonna shoot this Greer are you gonna film this and I was like yeah but if I'm filming then I'm gonna be too distracted and Omo is always very supportive so he's like look man you you tell me but I know this kid Hunter I went to school with him he's great he used to work for Sean Price Williams like it, it really to me makes a lot of sense and so I met I met him and it was just perfect we already all of our kind of references our jams when we would talk about 
like Fat City, these kind of things. It was just kind of everything kind of gelled perfectly. And then we kind of went over concerns about cameras because I had a, a red camera already that we had bought. And then he was worried about low light. So then we got a Gemini. And then we had these two cameras and then we were convinced that if, if he was operating one and I was operating one, we couldn't really ever miss anything. And then we still, when there's really big things happening, we could still have an aux camera and divide. There were even days where we had to split crews, you know, so. So you, you operated one and he operated one all the time? Pretty much, I would say almost all the time. I would, I, I, I would say about maybe 10 to 15% of the time I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Longer and shorter lens, right? Yeah. And and you did you did you did you give him a specific path and camera movement or you let him discover? Uh, I think different for different for each time actually. I, I have a lot of faith in, in Hunter. I, I, I would say we would really just be there looking, and you know if it fits, and you'd kind of have you'd feel like they're going on it, and it either inspire you to kind of work on that same thing, imagining how they would work in the edit. You would have a little bit of that, a little bit of this or you would not really like it. So you'd go to try to find a better alternative. So I would never try to tell him what to do. I would more try to find a solution. And then if, if, if not, you know, kind of meet in the middle, but. What did the screenplay look like? Did you describe, was it a screenplay that described the basic situation and then you workshopped it on the day or was it a screenplay that was very precise in the beats on the scene? The, the screenplay was actually pretty concise. Uh, but uh, I would say well, we, act, we, we filmed and we added a lot. And then in the edit, we ended up going almost the, all the way kind of back to the original. We, what we, the, the, the structure was the same, but what we ended up doing is taking more out of it. So yeah. it, it was that, That's funny you say that, yeah. Because yeah. there is a, there's several moments in, you know, people think that editing is cutting. And editing is not cutting <laughs> in many ways is the decision to hold the, the integrity of a shot yeah. for as long as it can sustain it. It's not about, oh, let's cut to something else. It's we're here, let's yeah. be here. Yeah. And the movie has that wisdom, has a lot of wisdom about holding, whether the camera is under the car in the grass and sustains that shot or, or, or is a contemplative shot uh, it, it is, it, it, there is no style of editing, but there, there is a wisdom and a cohesiveness to the editing that, that, that is very, very interesting for me to hear that you discarded a lot. Yeah. Because well, it feels East, like that. Ismail, yeah, well, Ismail had this brilliant idea, which was to, we put the whole scene down on cards. And then as we would lay it down, we would look to see how true we were to the actual original thing. And then we would see it you know, go from these really dramatic changes to being more normal or, or normal within the original format of, of the configuration. And yeah, and it was beautiful. And, we were, and they're all being held by stones, which I thought was a very accurate way to think about it is that they're there and they have this potential amount of weight on them, but they could easily move in the wind, you know, not, not to hold it too tight. And um, we were also there in Mexico, which was almost brilliant idea. So we were working and I think pretty much the ideal setting to be as loose as one can be and let really let it live, let it breathe. We let the shots breathe while we're on set and we let the edit breathe and we just hammered away and we didn't stop until we thought it was, was you know, perfect. And in Mexico, life just comes at you from every, from every angle. It's just, you get drunk in life. Yeah. It's, and it's incredibly inspiring. I, 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 and not in a corny way, in a very impactful, real way, it shakes you, uh, it awakens you. You're not in a placid, perfect street with a clone shopping mall in the distance. It's, it's a very, uh, it's a life force. And, and now, uh, when, now, now that you finished, one of the things that strikes me uh, about the way you talk about the experience is that uh, everything was an art project, everything, on the shoot, the way you approach the layout, the, the decisions in editing, uh, this seems to me to come from the nearness of the two of you, number one, but also your discipline as an artist where you understand that the gesture in the creation, in the contemplation, in the exhibition, in the execution 
everything is of a piece with the spirit of the of the art did, did that come from there yeah i would say absolutely even so much so that i remember for about two years i collected just the bacon fat that i knew was going to be in the deep background in the shot in the trailer i was like this is going to make the perfect light and every day i would pour the bacon and i would just be like this is it and it would just be sitting there and like I, I, I now even live in the same house as my family and you can see its residual effect of having so many kids and living this kind of studio environment. Everyone would give me shit about having this bacon fat and I was like, I know it's gonna be there. It's gonna be in the film and it was perfect. I just wanted to go back to the edit and Ismael de Diego, who I think did an amazing job. We knew he was gonna edit the film before we made the movie. And Greer mentioned this last week when we were having a conversation with Roger Derling at Santa Barbara and He's from Cuba. So having someone interact with this American story where there's baseball and the prom and all these things, but he didn't have that experience growing up. So I thought it, we, we, we both thought that it would be really interesting to see what his, you know, what he'd bring to the table, how he would see the story. And as an outsider, putting that together, I think it made something different. I think there's a lot of movies, you can say it's derivative of a high school movie, but I think the language that the movie's in is completely different than another movie about high school. And I, and I think that thanks to Ismail, I think he, he brought in a tremendous amount of, I think his, his, his perspective um, really would added a lot to the movie. And both Greer and I are forever grateful for the amount of time he put in and he also just, was open to doing things, you know, I, that were di that weren't only on the script, switching things around and just showing us things that we never even imagined were possible. So that was a great relationship, and we had a tremendous, we had the best time with him. I mean, it was every every part of the of of this was fun. Hitchcock used to say that in order to be universal, you have to be specific. You know, if, if, if the people trying to make a movie that will speak to everyone speaks to no one. You know, when you speak only to the most intimate and most specific of your sensibilities, then it speaks to everyone. And, and I, I cannot imagine, and this is, this is the area where I saw a kinship with the Gia and Sophia. Uh, their, the latitude of their narratives, their, their stories is so intimate. It's almost like a diary. You know, that you feel that, that, that you feel that that's living not out of an imposture or a reminiscence, but is essential and intimate. And this movie has that. And I, I, I find it, uh, I find it, I, I cannot but ask you, are you guys working on something else already? And what that may be, because uh, this is so, such a specific thing that troubled you. And I think you kind of sold it through the movie. You made sense of the experience through the movie. Well, right now we're finishing a movie that we finished filming before the pandemic that both Greer and I produced with our friend Alejandro Castro, who's in the movie. He's the guy who's, he's in the pool with Caroline and then he gets on the bed and he looks at her and he says, can I stay here? She's like, I just want to sleep alone. He's like, all right, I'll see you at school. Um, and he just finished a film that he made he directed and acted in, in Madrid, and it's about um, to toxic masculinity. And we're currently editing that right now. So that's actually the next project we have in line right now, which we're really excited about. It's pretty, um, it's pretty funky. He's a- Are you having as much fun? You said, are we gonna, did you have as much fun? Well, we have, we have fun with him, sadly, because of the pandemic, when they were doing the reshoots, we couldn't go back there and they got lucky and finished, filming the movie the day before this whole, this whole thing just unfolded in front of us, in front of everybody. Um, but someone, someone who's actually really funny in the movie is Enrique San Francisco, who just passed away, who is a Spanish actor. And I'm, I'm, in a, I'm excited to show it to you. And it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's different, but I, I, think it'll, I think it also leaves a certain, an impression. He has his own voice. Now, uh, Greer, if you can tell me a little bit, the movie, the movie is finished. Then, all of a sudden, you're in Venice, uh, and and what has the dialogue, uh, the movie with the audience and you, of of course, how has it been? How did you encounter the world, and how did the movie encounter the world? What, what was that 
like? It's, it's been an, an amazing experience, you know, and we've all been in it all, so often together, you know, in Venice, we were always there. We were able to kind of experience the kind of the red carpet, which is very much a first thing. Alma had been to these festivals with the limelight, all these things. It's, but then the, the, the reception was incredible. In Venice, everyone was, was giving us a real, you know, where you hear about the standing ovation, you don't even really think that that's a thing and it really happens, you know, people come up to you. Um, when we were in a smaller uh, situation in, um, in Portugal, it was more intimate. They were, they were kind of discussing kind of the ending and I was able to talk about the ending and I'm glad that you also thought, had the same opinion and, and it was great. But that, that's, that, that's what was so amazing is that there was older people and younger people and everyone, were, everyone connected with this story and, and the state of, of youth. So I, I thought that it was, it went, you know, I mean, I, I think now it's really the time, you know, I, I won't really know because it was always in festival settings. So the people that are there are generally film enthusiasts. And, and you found that anywhere you went, there was commonalities. Yeah. Like you said about Roger in Cuba or me in Mexico or Portugal, everybody identified that essential mystery of adolescence, huh? Yeah. Definitely. What's interesting as such an American movie, people can connect with it. And it was interesting that the movie actually had very much a life it, until Santa Barbara. I mean, I, I guess Alabama also in the summer, but the movie hadn't been shown in the United States. So we were only showing the movie in Europe and people are dealing with this baseball. And before they even see the movie, they're saying, uh, I don't really like baseball. I don't really know anything about it. And then people are watching and they realize that's just the backdrop of the movie. There's a lot more to it. And it's more universal than it may seem. You can't judge a book by its cover. Well, what is beautiful about the movie and the reason I think is, of, is the purity of the voice is the reasons why somebody may reject it are the exact same reasons why somebody will love it to death. And now you're on the threshold of having a, a new experience when it goes, uh, you know, when you, you go through this screening, which is virtual, when more people have access to it uh, digitally and, and, and it can circulate the way a song circulates. For me, the movie has that quality. It has the quality of a song. It has the quality of something that you play and immerse in. That's, in my opinion, all cinema aspires to be music. And when, when a piece of film achieves that uh, in any way is wonderful. So I wanna thank you. And uh, hopefully when we're watching your next movie, we'll be together somewhere and we will continue this conversation. Thank you everyone and go watch the movie. Thank you, Guillermo. It means a lot for you to have you here. We really appreciate this.